So as you said, my the topic of my lecture is to what <clears throat> to what extent are Bible translations governed by theology? <clears throat> it will focus on texts about Jesus, Christological Christological texts, and I will and therefore start with a question. <clears throat> Who is the biblical Jesus? The answer depends upon which Bible translation you, re you read. Most people do not know the source languages in which the Bible is written. Rather, most people tend to read their Bible translation as the Bible. So Bible publishers therefore have the power to define <clears throat> the Bible and decide how the biblical Jesus is presented to the reader. However, there are and there is, exist different kinds of translations with different priorities. <clears throat> Ever since antiquity with Saint Jerome, these two translation strategies have been known. These two labels and dichotomies, meaning for meaning and word by word, illustrate the different priorities in translating. <clears throat> so for instance, the meaning for meaning translation is also called a free form of translating or idiomatic, as opposed to the word by word, also called literal translation. Meaning for meaning translation is also called um, content-based translation in that it seeks to clarify the content for the reader as opposed to the word by word translation which tend to follow this source uh, source texts rather and translate the form of the source text to the target language. <clears throat> the idiomatic uh, translation approach is also called a meaning translation in that it seeks to clarify the meaning for the reader. But one may ask, uh, what about the word by word translation approach? Is it not interested in meaning? <clears throat> I would say, of course, it's interested in meaning, but it, it's more reluctant in clarifying the meaning for the reader. But of course, it, it's a meaning translation as well. In the meaning for meaning approach, the translator take this, takes the stand as a commentator or <clears throat> interpreter of scripture for the reader. And hence there is, the translations often are less open to interpretation for the reader, as opposed to a word by word, where the translator tries to facilitate the text for interpretation for the reader and leaves the text more open to interpretation for the reader. That is, that is if the source text is open to interpretation. <clears throat> of course, any model as clear cut as this will have to simplify. And I think it's important to remember that it's more important to look at how these ideas, I, how these ideas are put into practice and looking at this clear-cut uh, model as you can see here. And we should also think about how the reader creates meaning. Uh, so the meaning is not just there in the text, but also takes form in the practice of reading by the people who are reading the Bible translation. <clears throat> Since I situate my study in the field of translation studies, I will describe the context for my research on Bible translations. Back in the 1960s, translation studies had a tunnel vision on, on the text. It focused solely on the text and the analytical terms that were being employed were accuracy, faithfulness, equivalence. And as these, these terms look at the relationship between the translation and the source text only, <clears throat> It largely ignored the extra textual causes of translation, intended to isolate the translation from the context <clears throat> it was made. This view of perspective changed with the coming of the cultural turn in translation studies. So in the last three decades, translation studies have focused on how translations are affected by the cultural context in which they are produced. 
This shift has led attention away from assessing translations solely with regard to how accurate they render the source text to the multiple sociocultural contextual factors that influence the choice of translation. So the main ob our observation is that no, influ no translation is made in a vacuum and every translation is made for a reason. So, so the question is, how does the contextual elements affect the translation? We'll have a look at this now. So the cultural turn or from text to context, <clears throat> we'll be looking at different contextual elements or so-called variables. Uh, this can, for instance, be to look at how the translator's subject, subject, subjectivity and how the translator's gender, class, age, or religious views affect the translation. Another relevant variable is to look at the connection between the translation and various institutions. In this lecture, I will specifically focus on the relationship between a Bible translation and religious institutions, and to what extent Bible translations uh, align with the agenda of this institution behind the translation. Another important variable is the question of readership. Who is the translation made for? And what does that entail for the profile of the translation? If the aim is to sell Bibles, would it be wise to fill the translation with interpretations that are deemed controversial or problematic by the recipients? Probably not. So the next variable, economics, that goes very much hand in hand with, with the variable of readership, uh, that you create a translation for a specific pur purpose and for a, pr for a pr uh, specific uh, target audience. So these are just examples of variables that come to play and affect the way the Bible is translated. I could have made up a few more examples, but I think you get the, you get the point that uh, translations are obviously influenced by the context in which they are made. <clears throat> as well as uh, the cultural term, translation studies, there's also talk about the ideological turn in translation studies, which focuses on the ideology of the translator or the institutions behind the translation, and also the ide ideology of the recipients. So the importance of ideological impact in translation is being increasingly recognized. As Stanley Porter puts it, the notion of theology having an impact on the translation has always cast its shadow on the enterprise. And when we are talking about theology, we're also talking about a particular form of theology. And today I will be focusing on the theology that was created in the fourth and fifth century. And we'll address how this particular theology has impacted various translations from antiquity and in modern Norway. So the question is of who is Jesus? Uh, although this view or Christology and the view of Christ is one of the factors that unites the main, main Christian denominations today. It was contested within the church in the fourth and fifth centuries. The tradition of the church was de developed gradually through controversial creeds, which canonized a particular view of Christ. And these uh, creeds and councils tended to more or less settle the issue once and for all. When the emperor, Roman emperor Theodosius I, <clears throat> by the end of the fourth century, made Christianity the official religion of Rome, of the Roman, uh, Roman Empire, it was, it was the Nicene version of Christianity and no other which was allowed, something which was enforced by both law and, and ecclesial authority. So the debates in the fourth century focus particularly on the origin of the sun. One of the beliefs was the view that was ascribed to Arius 
uh, a priest from Alexandria who held that the son, that is Jesus, was pre-existent, existed with God, but never, nevertheless that he was created by God. So for him, if the son was created by God, Jesus couldn't, couldn't be truly God. What became the right view or the orthodox view, however, however, was the view that the son was not created by God, but rather he was begotten by God. In this view, the son had always existed and was of the same substance as God, the father. Therefore, the son could be seen as truly God. So this particular view of uh, Jesus, the son, was canonized in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, and again verified at the Council, Council of Constantinople in 381. So the question at hand is, how did, how did this controversial reception history affect the way that the Bible is translated? Let us now look at the relationship between Bible translation and religious institutions. Because Bible translations are often housed in and associated with the institutions of the church. As Lawrence Venuti has put it, tra translations can help to define and inculcate orthodox belief by inscribing canonical texts with interpretations that are compatible with prevailing theological doctrine. And Bible translation also contribute, contribute contributes to the identity formation of uh, the ancient, of the ancients, agents within the church, or those who function within it. The inscription of these doctrines in a translation can maintain and strengthen the authority of the church by reaffirming the institutionalized interpretation of the Bible. <clears throat> One example of such practice is the Vulgate translation. The translation was commissioned by Pope Damasus to Jerome and was therefore closely connected to the religious institutions of the church. So the Vulgate is but one instance in which the doctrines of the church were reaffirmed with translation choices that safeguarded and reaffirmed the doctrines of the church. One example is the translation of Proverbs 8.22. In the Aryan and Nicene controversy in the 4th century, Proverbs 8.22 was used by the Aryans as a proof text for, the, for their view that the sun was created. So the figure of wisdom that we can read about in Proverbs 8 <clears throat> was directly identified with the sun, Jesus. So in these debates, most parties related to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible from the second century, which had translated the Hebrew, Adonai, Kanani, into Kyrios Ektisenme, the Lord created me. Jer Jerome, how however, chose to translate the Hebrew into Dominus Posseditme, the Lord possessed me. This interpretation avoided the problematic created me from the Septuagint, and in, and in effect, uh, strengthened the orthodox view that the son had always been there as God's possession. However, uh, the accepted meaning of the Hebrew word, kana, in the scholarly literature is acquire or bring forth, or as the Septuagint, create, and does not support the translation choice uh, put forward in the Vulgate. So, seen against this backdrop, the rendering of this verse in the Vulgate is conspicuous, but it makes sense uh, that it, they chose, or both Jerome chose to translate it with Lord possess me in light of the controversies that um, were in the fourth century. So, again, uh, text and, and context are truly, <laughs> truly connected here, I think. Yes, yeah, so this strengthened the orthodox view and avoided the problematic Septuagint translation. 
Another in instance is uh, the Greek word uh, monogenes from the New Testament, which is used uh, about other people than Jesus. But in the Johannian literature, uh, it is used about Jesus many times, and it's an important <coughs> Christological title. So um, the Greek word, word from the New Testament is monogenes, and in the Old Latin, which, which was accident before the making of the Vulgate, and they, these manuscripts render the Greek monogenes into unicus, uh, only or unique. Uh, Jerome, however, he translated this into the Latin unigenitus, which means only begotten, which again strengthened the orthodox view uh, because of the connection with the doctrine that the son was begotten by God, and therefore the son was the only begotten by God. In the scholar, scholarly liter literature, however, there is a growing consensus that the word means only or only unique. In this corresponds uh, with the more with the old Latin rendering, uh, which had rendered the word as unicus rather than unigenitus. But again, uh, context is relevant to understand the translation in itself, and that it was probably directed to strengthen the orthodox view of, of the sun in the church. Let's hear, yes. Uh, but Bible translations can also serve another purpose, and that is to challenge a religious institution. So they can challenge the institutionalized interpretations <clears throat> in an effort to change the institution or found a new one. So to, to the right here, you can see William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into English. And because of his doings, <clears throat> he was convicted of heresy and executed by strangulation, after which his body was burnt at the stake. So the problem with Tyndale's English translation was that it challenged the institutions, or the, sorry, the interpretations of the Vulgate which also meant that his translation challenged the authority of the Catholic Church. So even though Tyndale was killed, his translation became a great source of inspiration for later English Bibles, such as the King James Version. I will now switch to a more modern context and look at Bible, translation, Bible translations in a Norwegian context. And I will focus on Bible translations made by the Norwegian Bible Society. And first, I will give a short presentation of each, each translation, and then look at uh, the translations of an important, important Christological, Christological text. So the first uh, translation into Nor Norwegian came in 1904, and it was based on the literal translation approach, which, which had been dominant in Denmark, Norway uh, since the 17th century. However, in the 1950s, uh, this seems to have changed. And there was a need of a translation that, that was more fluent in Norwegian and could be easily understood by the, uh, the audience. And therefore the NBS decided to make a linguistic renewal of the translation from <clears throat> 1904, which was revised in 1930. And, uh, but obviously it was not just a re linguistic renewal of the translation. Uh, it was rather a uh, idiomatic translation. Uh, and this translation marked the breach with a 500 year old translation tradition of translating the Bible in Denmark, Norway, which was the literal translation. And this tendency in the 1950s continued as well into the 1960s and 70s in, in Norway. <clears throat> when they made the Norwegian 1978 translation, which was largely 
I am an idiomatic translation. And really also based on the theory of uh, Eugene Nida called dynamic equivalence. So the assumption of Nida was that you shouldn't translate it literally, but you shouldn't just transfer the form of the text <clears throat> to the target text, rather to preserve the meaning of the source text, uh, you, ha you had to alter the form of the text. Uh, but what if the source text is ambiguous? More, more than once, you would think that it doesn't, the source text, source text can't just mean one thing. It might mean two or three or four things, diff depending on uh, which perspective you're taking. But uh, to Naira, uh, the biblical authors intended one meaning only. And therefore, the translator should try to get, the, get a grip of uh, the intention by the author and translate this meaning to the modern reader. So the question, is this a correct translation? <laughs> Must, according to Naira, be answered in terms of another question, namely, for whom? <clears throat> Correctness must be determined by the extent to which the average reader for which a translation is intended will be likely to understand it correctly. In other words, we are not content merely to translate so that the average receptor is likely to understand the message. Rather, we aim to make certain that such a person is very unlikely to misunderstand it. So this understanding of Naira assumes that the translator has the solution and is able to provide the correct answer or the right interpretation. At the same time, this approach is pragmatic, so the right translation must be adapted so that the modern receptor is very unlikely to misunderstand it. And here you can see the translators at work comparing <clears throat> their drafts with translations in other languages English, Spanish, German, French, <laughs> etc. But in uh, 2011, the Norwegian Bible Society published another translation. And this translation was uh, opposed to the 1978 translation by, based on the thoughts of Eugene Naida and was uh, marketed as closer to the source text than the former translation from 1978, while at the same time staying, being closer to modern Norwegian language. And Bible 2011 also became a massive sales hit and the 2012 bestseller in Norway, something which did not go unnoticed by international media, as you can see here. Bible 2011 started out in 1999 as a revision of the former translation, but it was later presented and marketed as a new translation. As the project leader put it, we became conscious of the fact that the rev revision mandate was so comprehensive that we were actually making a completely new translation. So the guidelines of Bible 2011 made it clear that the translation was supposed to take a giant leap towards a more literal translation rather than the strongly idiomatic 1978 translation. So this principle was reinforced by the adopted literary approach to Bible translation with its focus on translating the form of the text rather than the presumed implications of the text. So the consequence of this would be, according to a project leader, <clears throat> if the text is presented with its ambiguities and texts, then all who hear and read it must become interpreters. And Paul Helge Hogan, one of the literary consultants who participated in the making of Bible 2011, asked the rhetorical question, specifically pointed at Nida's the theory. Does anyone actually want us to believe that the Bible narratives can always be broken down into unambiguous statements? To him, obviously, no. 
in my PhD, I looked at <clears throat> the translation process and follow certain texts from the development, from the first draft to the final text. And one of the possible hypotheses that I had was uh, if the source text is challenging uh, or ambiguous, probably this will not be retained in the translation uh, from 1978. But perhaps in the Bible 2011, there will this translation will probably retain um, these challenging aspects of the source text uh, so that they all will be inter interpreters of scripture to confer the earlier quote here. <clears throat> so we'll look at uh, one example now, uh, that is uh, Colossians 1.15. And the issue at stake, or at least traditionally, uh, is whether Christ is seen as a creature. And uh, this text was very important in the Arian and Nicene controversy. And as you know, the orthodox view is that the Son is begotten and is not made or created. If we look at some comparative translations, the King James versions, uh, Version, translates the expression into that Jesus is the firstborn of every creature and also other English Bible translations that translate it with the that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation and in this translation there is the possibility that one can see Jesus as part of creation uh, which is not in, in line with orthodox theology. But the consensus in the commentaries and the exegetical literature is that it is indeed an ambiguous statement. And the commentaries support the literal rendering as above, the firstborn of all creation. <clears throat> when comparing Bible translations, we can see a very clear development or a tendency in idiomatic translations. So for instance, in the NIV or the Net Bible, the firstborn is not of all creation, is over all creation. And today's English version, the firstborn son, superior to all created things. So in these translations, there is a tendency to eliminate the ambiguity of whether this firstborn is part of all creation and rather to single out the firstborn as being superior in one sense to all creation. So as I said, I was tracing the development from the first draft to the final text. So let me start by looking at the text in the youth translation from the 1959 or 1961. So in the youth, youth translation, there's an interesting feature in the manuscripts of the uh, translator. So I can, as you can see here, the translator used the typewriter. And unlike a Word document of today, one can actually, actually see what's been deleted. So the erasure shows that the translator at first translated the Greek expression of Alice Kaplingan, which is similar to the English of all creatures. Uh, one reservation must be made here, however, since the English preposition of carries a wide range of meaning and the English expression firstborn of all creatures may be a bit more ambiguous than the noted expression in Norwegian. But the point remains, and that is that there is a discernible avoidance of renderings that may be seen as problematic in light of Christian orthodoxy. This uh, tendency is also possible to trace in the archive material of the next translation, the 1978 translation, where the translator had suggested the following rendering in his first draft. <clears throat> so, the first of the of Alles Kaltninger. The firstborn, uh, similar to the English, the firstborn of all creation. But then his uh, draft went to 
or received a suggestion from the Svarol, who was the head of or the leader of the translation committee, who suggested the firstborn son over all creation or over all created things. So this suggestion went back to the meeting, meeting in the translation committee and they decided to change the text from change the first draft to the final text, which you can see here, the firstborn or stands above or over all created things, which eliminates this theological ambiguity. What about uh, Bible 2011, which was supposed to be closer to the source text than the 1978 translation? In the first draft, uh, this ambiguity is retained. Uh, in the first draft, it's, uh, he's the image of the invisible God, all creation's firstborn. Or in his comment, he proposed also the firstborn in all creation, or as before. Also in the second draft, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn among all creation or all created things. So the point is here that the challenging aspects of the source text is retained in the translator, translator's first and second draft. Uh, but his uh, translations were not uh, presented clearly to the translations committee. So they didn't, didn't get to see the, for the, the first drafts of the translator. But at the end of the process, uh, in the last process of editing, uh, a Norwegian poet <clears throat> read through all the drafts of the New Testament text. And as you can see here to the right, Hogan or his comments is notable. Although he did not know Greek, he familiar, familiar himself, himself with the exegetical literature and used Bible software so that he could follow the syntax of the source text. And he wrote an interesting comment about the translations of translation of verse 15. He put a, he put a question mark above the rendering which stands over all creation and commented. Shouldn't it simply be the firstborn in creation compare the source text? It seems quite clear that he was wondering about the chosen rendering, which he contrasted with the source text. <clears throat> in the final editing of the Bible 2011, the verse was once more changed and the reasoning behind the change was provided to the board of the Bible Society which was the body that authorized the text. In this reading, sorry, in this reasoning, we re read that the new text is, he is, the he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn before all creation. Why before? Temporal genitive refers to an earlier stage in the course of events, and before is interpreted as the most likely interpretation and here it is presented as though it's a consideration of, uh, of grammar and that the new rendering is justified by Greek grammar. And the problem with this reasoning is that a temporal genitive is never used in this way, this way in Greek and therefore cannot justify this rendering. So why the avoidance of the problematic statement from the source text. In the Bible translations from 1959 to 2011, the translation processes entailed a great barrier to avoid renderings that are open to heretical interpretations. <clears throat> so the main findings in my study, Bible 2011, was it or is it closer to the source text then the translation from 1978, 78. Probably on, on, on the overall result, it's closer, but uh, a lot of, but my answer, I would question that claim in the important theological text. But um, as the Norwegian Bible Society presented it, if the source text and its form 
or ambig ambiguous or challenging, one, one would expect this to have been retained in Bible 2011, even if it, if it would potentially have given rise to potentially problematic interpretations. But however, the opposite occurred in a translation process. And the result is a translation that forces many of the disputed Christological texts to conform, conform to the theological precision that was developed during the formation of dogma in the fourth and fifth century. So my conclusion was that the 1978 translation is closer to the source text than Bible 2011. And that was especially uh, surprising because it was supposed to be the other way around. And another, another thing was that the Christological, Christological texts were made more and more compatible with the church and doctrine during the translation project. So uh, the first and second drafts typically were reflected interpretations that retain the ambiguous and challenging aspects of the source text. But in the course of events and uh, during the translation process, these interpretations were overturned and replaced with interpretations that safeguarded the, safeguarded the theology of the church. <clears throat> so this was caught up by journalists and media and launched a debate in Norway about the relationship between theology and translation. Under the, under the heading, Bible translation faces strong criticism, my findings were presented to the public with a criticism against the New Norwegian Bible Society for not translating according to their own standards or to, to the premises dead set, which was translating closer, closer to the source text than the former 1978 translation. But this was uh, obviously something they had to reply to. And the theological consultant of Bible 2011 claimed that the critic puts a strange straitjacket on the text when he doesn't let the author himself say what he thinks about the question. So in the other words, if a text from Paul is unclear, the translator should be able to look at clear or clearer text from the same author. The only problem with this approach is, first of all, is that there is no consensus <clears throat> in scholarship pertaining to what is clear in, for instance, with Paul. And secondly, it is difficult to imagine that the biblical writers of the, of the fourth, uh, sorry, it is difficult to imagine that the biblical authors from the first century would address and answer the questions from the fourth and fifth century directly. And for that matter, that they were in some way um, managed to answer our questions, our modern questions directly. So the dis disputes in the fourth and fifth century rather seems to suggest that the source text <coughs> was open to different interpretations. But the important question for our purposes is whether a translation should retain the challenging and ambiguous parts of the source text. In the answers put forward by the, by the project leader, the answer was yes, if the source text is ambiguous, it should be retained in the translation, thereby making all who hear and read it interpreters. But when it came right down to it, the answer was no. However, later, uh, the Norwegian Bible Society promised to pull oneself together when it comes to a Bible translation. But even though they had admitted they, they had clarified the Christological text, <clears throat> they outright denied that this had anything to do with theology or church dogmatics. To them, it was only a matter of clarifying the Bible in light of other biblical passages. But then, 
In, a, in an interview with the Christian newspaper at Dagen, the former new project leader of Bible 2011 admitted that theology did have an impact on the translation choices in Bible 2011. When asked if the translation has a certain character of preserving the doctrine of the Trinity, he replied, it actually does. We must keep the doctrine that is already there in the text. It is an ideal that the, trans that the translation should be open, but sometimes people do not have the same qualification to see the whole that a Bible translator must have. All who have had Jehovah's Witnesses on the door know that they are very good at expressing their views, and they often use single verses taken out of context. Therefore, there is no reason for the Bible Society to translate in a way that can be misunderstood. So this last sentence about misunderstanding reflects the thoughts of Eugene Naira in that it presupposes that the translator can grasp, grasp the true meaning of the text and remove conceived misunderstandings for the readers. So this also demonstrates uh, an example of how Bible translations can serve, an, serve as an ideological tool in its time and can be used to protect the teachings of the church by safeguarding the important text so that the reader will not end up with a heretical Christology, but rather with the right orthodox understanding of Christ. So I think that these texts or this example shows uh, show that it is never just about the text and illustrate how theology is and probably always will be an important factor in Bible translation. Thank you.